and listen, I, I wake up some mornings and I had, I'm not feeling good, mm-hmm. you know, and um, I struggle. I struggle around dates, birthdays, anniversaries. Numbers are really significant for some reason for us. And, you know, it's hard. But, you know, when, when you fall down and have those bad moments, you've still got this foundation that you've built for yourself around the way you're viewing the world and your reality that you're living in. That's probably one of the most powerful five minutes of the podcast I've ever had. I don't think you really understood what you've said there. When you go back and listen I, back to it, <laughs> when you go, I, I, I know full well you didn't because you do. You were in the state where I go into and you're in a flow state and you were just talking. Welcome to the Prime Life Project podcast, a place to help you unlock your full potential, both mentally and physically, to become the best version of you. Welcome back to another episode of the Prime Love Project podcast, a place to help you mentally and physically become the best version of you. This is the third time I've recorded this introduction because something's gone wrong. The first time it was me messing up and then my garage band that I use is kind of messed up. Um, now, today I've got a guest and it's going to be a fantastic conversation about a topic that isn't openly spoke about. And I know this is going to help a lot of people out there that are struggling and potentially going through something very, very similar and not sure where to turn. And that's the whole point of this podcast is it's just helping people to basically just give them a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. So um, my guest today is Mr. Joe Rafter. How are we? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, thank you for bringing me to this lovely studio. I oh, know, we've just been talking before we started about, yeah, about your books, books and stuff. And yeah. I get to have a great conversation. So yeah. I've been chatting for about 40 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and again, it's always good to, to connect with people and again, realise that you uh, went to a school just down the road from me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I had a bad experience yeah. when I played football there. You were in the same school. It wasn't me. That time. It wasn't it, me it throwing the you. bricks. <laughs> it won't be. Um, so today, the topic we're talking about, like I said, it's. Um, Again, it's a sensitive topic, uh, and I just want to say thank you very much for taking time to come talk about this, no because problem. again, I know it's not going to be easy for you to talk about, yeah. but again, we're on the same mission here to basically yeah. get the information out there to help some people. Um, we're going to talk about the, the the trust and why we said that all up, but before we do that, we kind of need to take it back to the beginning. So can you talk to me uh, about um, your son, Harley? Can you give me a real brief overview? Yeah. And then we'll sort of deep dive and sort of go with it and go from there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So uh, in 2005, uh, two days before... Uh, my 22nd birthday, uh, my son was born. His name was Harley J. And, uh, you know, his mum was 19 years old. So, you know, we were kids ourselves, um, you know, bringing the baby into the world. And we had a relatively normal life for three months. Um, you know, there was there was no signs of uh, anything that could possibly go wrong. Um, and then at the age of three months, just after, um, you know, turning three months, he had a seizure. Um, and... We took him into the hospital. We just thought, you know, this is watching an infant have a seizure is a really kind of um, it, it's it's quite shocking. You know, mm-hmm. it's not what you expect, particularly as a new parent. And uh, he continually had these seizures, and the doctor said that we can't get these seizures under control. Um, and I remember actually at that time, this is one of the memories that I have that I had this sense that the doctors knew what was going on, but they didn't want to say until they were absolutely sure. Yeah, there was cross off other things first. Of course. Than, like, going the of worst course. Case scenario first. So almost like, oh, you know, so, but you know, we you know, we just kind of like, you know, went with it with the doctors. We was in, we was in hospital for about six weeks and uh, before they even told us anything after six weeks and just said, look, there's a neurological problem here um, and he is going to have uh, lots of challenges in his life, but we can't tell you what they are because we don't know. Every case is different. And we didn't actually... Um, get a diagnosis. Harley uh, was diagnosed at the age of five. It took five years to get to the bottom of what his condition was. So from three months to the age of five, um, it was all guesswork with the doctors. And what happened is, is that, um, me and his mum uh, were kind of like trained in nursing, essentially. And, you know, the, word of, the world of medicine and neurology and learning how to um, raise Harley with the issues that he had an everyday was a new lesson as to you know what was going on for him. In summary, Harley was partially blind, had physical disabilities, um, had severe epilepsy and significant learning difficulties. And um, so, at that point, I say at, at the point where we learned that his life um, wasn't going to be normal. Um, that's when your grief begins. Mm-hmm. Because from that moment on, you, you start to grieve for the life that you thought you was going to have. Yeah. So everything changes for you at that point. 
and it's scary and it's unknown. Uh, the one lucky thing that that me and his mum Lucy had was a family. Uh, we had we were both really fortunate to have family to around to support us the best they possibly could. Mm. But you also feel very lonely because you know no one can help you. There is no cure for this. The doctors don't know what's going on, and that makes that puts you in a very lonely place. And as a parent, for well, the parents out there, they will be able to kind of like um, acknowledge that your number one goal as a parent is to protect your children. So when that's taken out of your hands, as a first time parent, it's kind of confusing. You don't really know how to respond, but it just becomes a very lonely and scary place. And you know, we're, we're still learning about life ourselves. Because, because since you were young as well, so it's not so like young. it's not like you're adults with loads of life experience. Like yeah, you, you, yeah. You, 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 like you said before, like essentially kids yourself, kids ourselves. And, and to put it into context for you, me and Lucy met in Tenerife. We both worked out abroad. I was out there for four years, just working in bars, having fun. We met. We came home together and then uh, Lucy found out she was pregnant, I think, within a month after returning. So we've gone from this kind of like typical young person's life, partying, beach every day, yeah. to at home, having a baby, and then this hit me like a sledgehammer. During the pregnancy, was there any signs of any issues at all? Zero. None. So the first time was that seizure? The first time was a seizure. And I think one of the things I think that we were fortunate around is that when Holly was born, we had three months of bond with him like a normal child and normal, any normal family would mm. uh, it was just no, that normal bonding time with your child it was after three months that we, we we found out something was wrong how did you deal with that that, that first seizure because that's something for me like i can't imagine so uh, my mum suffered epilepsy so I, as an adult i understand i was um i think maybe 12 13 14 when she explained to me if this happens this is what you kind of got to do but as kids seeing your newborn baby mm. having a seizure how did that, how did you deal with that? Because that's something that no parent ever wants to see. And as you said, I can imagine it's traumatic anyway. Mm-hmm. How did you respond to that? And also, with now what you know, is there a correct way to deal with a child having a seizure for anyone? Hopefully, they never will. But if they have to go through that with a child, how do you deal with a seizure with a child? Well, well, first of all, what I'll say is, if you sat here to me right now and says, just so you know, I've got epilepsy and I could have a seizure. And if I do, could you please do this? I'd get nervous, even though I've been through all that before. Because when it's your child, all that goes away and your parental instinct kicks in. And the first thing you do when you see the seizure is make sure that they're okay. When someone's having a seizure, there's not much you can do. So the first thing you need to do is make sure, are they in a safe space? So are they, because it's all involuntary movements that, 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 that you're watching. So is it safe? Are they going to hurt themselves? And it's really important to acknowledge that they can hear you. So they're, they're, you know, their senses are still are still active so it's not like they're, they're unconscious so it's really important to talk to them to tell them that you're there hold their hand and create a calm environment for them as much as you possibly can i mean a doctor would tell you that when you're they're having a seizure without medical intervention there's nothing really you can do but i know that with harley that wasn't true the moment i got them into a quiet environment i was he's small so i could pick him up even when he was having a seizure take him somewhere quiet Breathe slowly, talk calmly, talk slowly, tell him it's okay, and he would come out of them as a result of that. Not all the time, but there are some times where you know that worked. Mm. And that's the thing I want, to, I want to get out of this as well, because hope to God that no one ever has to go through this stuff with a child, but you never know. And just by hearing something, you know, when you're going through something traumatic, the brain kind of kicks in, oh, I remember hearing something. So I just wanted to make sure that, because I heard that part of the story, I read that. So I wanted to make sure that any parent listening to this, yeah. if a child does have a seizure, Great advice there. Like even because I didn't realise that the senses were still active. Yeah, I wasn't aware of this again. Just the fact of just be calm, be talking, calm. nurturing yeah. again. Just that physical touch as well. Just, yeah. just holding the hand. Yeah, powerful. I, yeah. I knew nothing about that. Yeah, it's the same behaviour as if your child's panicking about something or they're distressed for anything. Not a se- particularly a seizure. You would be compassionate and calm and calm them down and hold their hand and tell them it's going to be okay. And really, that's all we can do um, in the, in the circumstances. So something that you mentioned on there is is the grief which I'm glad you went there because that was still something I really wanted to talk about. Um, when you found out that um, Harley was struggling to the extent that he was, and then you started to grieve, did you feel guilty for grieving at all? Because I imagine that when people go through that, they can almost feel a sense of guilt maybe. that It's like, because the child's still there and you've just still got a life, but you're then grieving something and but the child's still there. Does that make sense? Yeah, not for a while because I didn't realise I was grieving. Um, being so young and not really understanding life and understanding my own feelings and thoughts of mind. I'm, I wasn't aware of myself as much as I am now. Mm. So, you know, in honesty, at first... Because this, this one, this one I'm interested about, because you're a very aware gentleman. Do you know what I'm talking to? I've been interacting with you. 
and I'm taking myself back because they said you're 39. Mm. So I'm, when you're talking now, I'm remembering it's not this gentleman in front of me no. that was dealing with this. It's a different version. It's a different you. version of you. Yeah. So this is something that I want the audience to understand here. Like this is, this is not the guy because you're very, very switched on. You're very clued up. Again, you're very well read. You're very aware. So when you're explaining this, I don't yeah. want to interrupt you there, but this is not the same guy now that was no. going through this. I want to make that very clear. I think that's a really good point because I was just a boy then and I'm a different person now and I'm, I'm a completely different person as a result of the experience I went through in the seven years of, of Harley's life. So, yeah, I was a different person then, and um, I didn't really realise I was grieving um, for a couple of years, and then I realised, actually, this is what's going on. You know, that's the life I thought I was going to have. And you're absolutely right. You Then guilt comes in, and guilt is something that I still live with now. Um, guilt and grief are like twins. So... I'm worrying that, you know, I'm not worrying, I'm grieving and thinking about the life that I could have had with Harley um, at the time when he, he, he's here. And then I feel guilty for wanting that life with him. Even though it's completely rational to want my son to be healthy and live a normal life. Um, and that's just simply how your mind works. And, and unless you're aware of that, your mind can really take over you. And, you know, throughout the journey, you know, you meet other parents and other families who are in similar circumstances and you know they they you know they're 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 at up by depression and grief and and unable to to process and 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 which is okay which is normal um i think one thing i'm fortunate about is i've always been naturally inquisitive and curious about life and after a few years after two or three years that kicks back in with me and i really wanted to start to understand why I felt like I did. Why I'm experiencing these things the way that I am. Why do I respond this way? Um, what am I learning from this? How is this going to help me? Um, all those sorts of things. How long did it take you to realise that you were struggling? And now looking back retrospectively, what was your mental health like at that time? Because again, you, you again, young, don't really know much. You've gone from this party lifestyle to now, again, wanting to be a father, to then seeing your child have a seizure, to now realising he's struggling. And obviously, we mentioned it about the guilt and grief, um, like twins. I love that, by the way. I've never heard that said before. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, and that's actually helped me myself with that. So thank you for that. Um, how was your mental health looking back? Like, were you, because um, yeah, you know, it's like the depression and all that sort of stuff. Was it quite hard hitting looking back at it? Was it subtle? Because as you mentioned, there'll be a lot of people right now that are struggling, going through something very, very similar. They are feeling the guilt. And they may be feeling a certain way, but they don't really know what's going on. So can you kind of like take yourself back to that situation mm. and talk to me about where your mental health was kind of at going through this? Well, I didn't realise there was something wrong with, with me and that I was struggling for years. And the reason why I was so unaware, I'd say at least three years, was because what happens is in that scenario, because, you know, it's your child, everything that you are and worth and all the issues and worries that you have, you literally take them and put them away because it's irrelevant. Because the only thing that's relevant today is his health. You've got to bear in mind that the doctor told us that he probably wouldn't make it past one year. And he lived till he was seven. Throughout his life, they told us he was going to die, I think it was four times. Um, and they got it wrong three of those times. So the, the level of trauma, looking back now, is so kind of like profound and significant. But at the time it just didn't register because all all I could, you know, all me and his mum cared about was making sure that that day went well and he's still here and we got to look after him the best we can. And we knew in the back of our minds, mum didn't like talking about it. I was happy to talk about it, but she didn't talk about the fact that his life was limited and we knew we were going to lose him at some point. So for me, it was like, I'm going to take all this, pack it away and just be in the moment with him and make sure that I'm getting the most out of this. That, so, the, so so on the benefit of that is is that during those moments I really lived with him I was really in the moment with him and that is something that I'm so happy about now I didn't waste one moment the downside is I was causing significant damage to my own mental health and emotional well-being mm. and it took a very long time to kind of unpack that I think that's such a, a powerful thing and yeah, it gives me chills when you're explaining that because it's there's a bigger <clears throat> picture there yeah. and it's like I said, if you had allowed yourself to really understand the situation that you were in you probably would have gone downhill pretty that, quickly. And I wouldn't have been in the moment with him. You, would, you probably wouldn't even been there, let's be honest. If you're struggling yes. that much with depression, yeah. you wouldn't have been there to, to, yeah. to be that father and yeah. actually experience any of this stuff. Yeah. So actually, as you're sort of saying there, you kind of just had to, it's just going to stay there. Yeah. But the problem with grief is, as you know, it's the most patient emotion. And if you don't deal with it, at some point it's going to come and kick your ass. Yeah. 
And that's just understanding that. And I think you sort of realize probably somewhere I'm going to have to deal with this at some point, yeah. but it wasn't an hour problem. Yeah. And the fact that you're able to actually make some amazing memories, yeah. I think that's absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, how, how do you get told and how do you deal with the news that you know your child's going to die? Because that is a parent's worst nightmare. Um, and again, you always hear that parents should never outlive their kids and stuff. To be told that, not just once, I think you mentioned that three times, what is that actually like to actually go through that and live that? Because that must be one of probably the most, apart from when he, he did pass, probably one of the mo- worst experiences. How do you keep such a tight knit and tight group, just you two, to make sure that you do show up each day? Because that's got to be, I imagine, probably one of the hardest things to go through, knowing that you've got to show up and you're not sure how long you've got mm. left. I, I can't really talk about... <clears throat> other people's experiences in this situation but for me and Lucy there wasn't a shock factor there I think that for parents who are told this and they have they think everything's fine is a completely different experience we had to grow into that so we knew his life was limited from a very young age and because his his care was so full-on we just went for it and we were just in and we knew in the back of our mind and we talked about it sometimes but didn't and then as we grew as parents and grew as people we we spoke about it more but but there's no point in in waking up every day at that point and acknowledging that before you go about your day what you need to do is understand that we, we understood that this was going to happen but we're just going to fight for every moment and that and we're going to deal with that later the problem really occurs is when when Harley's health started to um decline it's when the doctors come along and go, we don't think you're gonna you're gonna be going home this time because you know we're in hospital. We had open access to the hospital ward, and they just look. We don't think you're gonna be going home this time. Doctors are very matter of fact. You know they're not trained. Mm. Like yeah. they, they can't they, speak they, like no, me and you. No. Okay, so isn't that, isn't that what the nurses are there for? I've heard the, the nurses. nurses are there, oh, they're, 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 they're the ones that are meant to almost deliver this kind of news because yeah. they can't. They like said they're so matter of fact. Yeah. That, Yes, yes, you you need to. You don't really want to be beating around the bush. Yeah. However, there's ways to deliver there's information. Ways to do it. And mum, <laughs> Lucy really needed that compassionate yeah. approach. I mean, I think as a man, I'm a little bit more black and white, and I could take the the, the kind of abruptness a little bit better. But Lucy definitely couldn't do that. But uh, we we were told by doctors that look, we don't think you make it home this time. And actually, me and Lucy looked at each other and goes, "I think we are. I think he's talking a little yeah. bollocks." Sorry, I'm allowed to. to oh yeah, 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 mate. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think he's talking a little bollocks because they, just... they didn't know Harley, and that's the thing, isn't it? Exactly like, that. Yeah. And the nurses do because the nurses are always there where doctors rotate around hospitals. So not many of them, apart from like your head consultant who oversees the case and your head neurologist who you have limited contact with, the nurses really knew us as a family. So. Yeah, you know, there was only the, there was four times from what I remember. I just want to. I just also just want to put in there that I've got some significant gaps in memory, mm-hmm. and that's trauma related. Yeah. Yeah. Um, from what I remember, there was four times, and two of those times it was just like, mm, no, you're talking waffle. Go away. You know, he's fine. Mm. We are going home. Uh, there was another time in which we were like really panicking, and we really thought this is the moment. But then he, he fought through that, and then there was the other time where, you know, that's when he sadly passed away. It must be amazing when doctors are saying that he's not going to go home and you know he is and he's there fighting mm. and then you take him home there must be a sense of like f you kind of thing like yeah he's stronger than you think he is like yeah do you know what i mean and from why again I, I did some research I, I know the story obviously not to the depth we're talking about right now but i think the whole underlying theme was the fact of he was only living until he's one and yeah. the life he was a fighter and he kept yeah. on going that must have been there, there, there is a sense of that the pride that we had for Harley for being so strong and for fighting for so long. But the other thing we, we need to acknowledge uh, with this point is that Harley's condition, Ponto Cerebellar Hypoplasia Type 6, first of all, the reason it has that name is because no one's given it a more, you know, a, a more mainstream name because it's so rare. Wasn't he, him and another person that had it at the time when he was alive? Was it him and another person? There were two him? people at the time in the world with that case. That's how rare it is, yeah. And he was the 11th recorded case in the world. So... You've got to realise these doctors are really working blind. Really working doing, blind. Doing the best they can. And they're doing the best they can. And, you know, when they come in and go, I don't think you're going to make it, they've just based that on another case that they've had somewhere else down the line. And, you know, it's just like, okay. But for me, that just stops there. You know, it, it, it is what it is. They're working blind. We're all working together to find out um, how we're going to do it. The, the remarkable thing about this is that they took our bloods and Harley's bloods and sent them all over the world to try and get to the bottom of what the condition was. 
for five years nearly. And they went to America, Australia. He was spoke about in conferences and auditor, everything. University is the lot. It was so rare. A group of students did it in Great Ormond Street. They found out what he, what his what his condition was. Just wow. students at university. It's unbelievable. Isn't that mad, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, it's you've got these, these high end academics. But sometimes isn't it interesting how we overthink things? Yeah. And students, because they don't have the experience of these doctors. Or the egos. Because what you've got to remember, these, uh, most of these doctors who were kept taking our bloods, in the end we had to say no. They wasn't doing it to benefit us or Harley because we knew that it was incurable. What they were doing is because they wanted to be the one to solve the problem. Yeah. Yeah, to write the literature, to sign the bottom of that page and go, we found it. Yeah. The students had no ego. They had no motivation. They, had to, they, they were given a task and they yeah. looked at it objectively and found out what it was. Isn't, it, isn't that mad? Incredible, incredible, yeah. Um, so... When you got, when you found out, first of all, how you say it, I don't know how you, it just rolls off the tongue like that. Uh, Ponto cerebellar hypoplasia type, type six. six. What fundamentally is that? I know you kind of mentioned some of the symptoms, but what fundamentally is it? And what's the difference between like type six and the, like, the other types? Of, what, like, what was special about this one? Okay, so to try and keep it as simple as I can, because it, it, it's just impossible to understand. Yeah. Do you understand what mitochondria are? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so it's like the batteries that we have within the cells. This is a mitochondrial disorder. Okay, so so his genes, basically, as you know, that when two people have a baby, they take your genes and they take mum's genes, and then they, what they do, they copy them to have a backup. Um, but everyone, I think, the numbers around, we all have at least 13 what we call misspelt genes. They, they, you misspelt them when you yeah. took them from your mum or your dad, right? The chances of you meeting a woman with the same misspelt genes is ridiculously rare. But me and Lucy had the same one. But not only that, there was only a one in four chance that you would take both of our misspelled genes because we've both got a backup correct one. So as long as you took the correct one from one of us, you would have been okay. But he didn't. He took both of them that were both misspelled genes or what we call defected genes. So as he's developing as a baby, this uh, attacks the mitochondria. So the mitochondria um, basically are constantly misfiring in the cells. And... Um, when your brain cells are misfiring, the brain just cannot develop properly. Mm. But not only that, it also affects your limbs, your muscles, everything. And this is why it is, at this time, it's just completely un- uncurable. I, 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 when you explain that, because I, I, I know exactly what I can do, so now I'm trying to process it in my head, like, that must have been, and you said there, it's, was there only at a certain age where it became really apparent? I know we said earlier on, you had got some good few months. At what age would you say it became really apparent that like his body wasn't firing properly, like again the muscles, the the, the, the oh, it wasn't stuff. long. Um, it was around about six months because he couldn't help hold his head up properly, and that was the, the they were the first signs. The 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 difference was though is that even though he had these issues, he was still developing in other things, like his levels of awareness and communication were still developing. And then, excuse me, at the age of five, he had um he went into an epilept- epileptical status. So that is where your brain is in a constant seizure. Uh, and he was in there for like three days. So your brain, his brain was seizuring for three days straight. So what they had to do was they had to put him on a ventilator in um, the um, intensive care unit. And he never really recovered from that. So when he came around from that, his body actually started to kind of like regress. Um, and, you know, his physical condition got worse. Was the reason why that happened? Do you know, was that, just, was that part of the condition? Just part of the condition. Was- so his brain was suffering. Was his body physically? Yeah. For the, for the- um, status. So your body can go in and out. So sometimes status can be you can't even tell the body's not even doing anything. Yeah. But actually, you can tell if you're if you're taught the signs by yes. doctors, and we were taught the signs. What was the support like that you got from the hospital for all this? So, like, uh, well, two two parts of that question. What was the support you got for Harley? And then the second part I'm going to ask you is about your, yourself uh, and, and your partner's Lucy. Like, so let's go with the actual support for for Harley. Like, what was the support like that you got for Exceptional. That? Absolutely exceptional. The NHS was a different place 15 years ago, 18 years ago, nearly. Um, and we was in, we lived on the South Coast, so it was Southampton General Hospital and Winchester Hospital between the two. Unbelievable. Just couldn't ask for more. Um, medical staff, exceptional. You've got some of the best people in the world. Um, you, the nurses were incredible. They did everything they possibly could, and there's literally nothing bad we can say about it. I mean, look, every now and again we had a few gripes, you know, as all parents. You get do. it anywhere, anywhere. Yeah, you get it anywhere. Yeah, yeah. but no, just absolutely exceptional. 
the way the NHS should be. If we're going to have an NHS, that's how it should be. And that's the way it was for us. So um, for Hawley, brilliant. For me and Lucy, nothing. Zero. No no support. None. Even as young parents as well? None. How was Lucy throughout this? I know you can't speak for somebody, but obviously you were in a relationship with her. How was her mental health? Because as you sort of said, she didn't want to talk about it. Although you weren't dealing with it, you were very aware of the situation. So what was Lucy's mental health like throughout this? Obviously, I know you can't speak directly for her, but obviously like... Well, Lucy um, developed quite severe anxiety. She would have that, you know, the severe panic attacks where you had to be hospitalised. Um, and she was on kind of that medication for anxiety and she really, really struggled through it. And there were times when Harley would be poorly and need hospital visits. And, you know, I remember one time I was in the hospital and Harley had a seizure, so I'm by his bed. Lucy had a panic attack. She got taken to casualty. So I'm running between both of them to make sure they're both all right. And I think that is when the penny dropped for me is that Harley's got obviously significant health issues. Lucy's suffering from mental health. If I fall, if I drop, mm. we're all fucked basically. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, you know, for me, I do that very manly thing that men tend to do yep. sometimes and just go, I'm, I'm sound. Yep. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm yep. good. Just, just you go away. Stop that voice. You can just you need to go somewhere, and I have to deal with you at some point in my life. I'm fine. So for me, it was all about um, making sure there was someone there in the house that could think objectively in times of crisis. How much pressure did you feel? None. I'll be honest with you, because at the time I wanted to be the person who looked after my family. So I was young and naive. Didn't know what damage I was I causing think, to listen, myself. Listen, listen, I think that's done you a favour. Yeah, well, <laughs> I genuinely, I think being young and naive there has done you a favour yeah. because looking back at it now as adults yeah. and you listen back to how, how you were doing that, you'd yeah. be like, mate, what the hell was I doing? What was but, I doing? Yeah, but, of course, yeah. But like we said before, if you'd really actually stopped, yeah. you probably would have fallen as well. Yeah. And then where would the story be? And then exactly, it would be a completely different story. And that, that's the thing I think, again, Harley's strength has to come from somewhere. Yeah. And I believe, again, yourself, Lucy, again, although Lucy was struggling, she still would have been strong in her own way as well. Yeah. Like, that's where I think they get their strength from, especially if you're creating all these experiences, you're actually there being present. Yeah. Whereas, and again, this this is my belief and stuff and whether people believe it or not, so that's their choice. Like, kids pick up on energy. Yeah. So well, whether well, Harley was struggling with whatever and blah, 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 I don't care, kids pick up on energy. Yeah. So there's you being constantly present. You're all in right there. Like, there's yeah. nothing else. It's just you and him right there. He had a pit upon that energy. Yeah. So no matter how much he was struggling, yeah. he wants to come back to that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. It, Whereas that, if you weren't there or you were exactly. struggling, what's he got to fight for? Does that make sense? 100%. And I th- there was one time of you know, thinking about me, this was horrendous. And we were on a day trip in London and Harley had a, a seizure that we couldn't get under control. So we carried the medication with around us and he couldn't get it under control. Went to Great Ormond Street. Um, we admit, they admitted him. They were just like, yeah, we know exactly what to do here. Don't worry, it's fine. And then they came back and we've done a blood test and we've seen something odd. And we just thought it was another one of these eye roll movements. Oh, here they go, look. There's another hero wanting to solve a problem. Uh, they went, no, there's something not right. Um, and they did a test on his stomach and they said, right, there's something going on in the stomach. And um, right now, if he's... If he bleeds, he basically is close to having a catastrophic bleed. Um, and we were like, why? And this was the start of the gut problems that he developed later on that we didn't know at the time. So we told this news. Lucy is, you know, really panicking and worrying. And then Harley was sick and it was red, like blood. She screamed, um, looked at me, didn't know what to do. So in her mind, she's like, well, we're both like, is this a catastrophic bleed? The doctors and nurses aren't there. In that moment, I just ran up to the bed, grabbed him. It, it was thrown up all over me and just stayed as calm as I could and told him it was going to be okay. And in the end, what it turned out was he was just by when he was being sick. Mm. He was bleeding on the, in his gut, internal, uh, but he was panicking. But, he, you know, after a minute of picking him up and, and listening to my voice, he just calmed down and he stopped being sick. And literally within minutes, he was... He, he smiled, which is so bizarre. And Lucy's like, you know, breathing because she's having a panic attack. And I just realised that even as a natural reaction, number one, I ran towards him, right? Because if you, if I if I try to rationalise that, like, what happens now if he's going to be sick? I would tell myself, I'll run out the street, I'll scream, I'll mm. cry. But actually in the moment, I ran up to him and picked him up. And you could tell how the, he had gratitude for me running up to him mm. and picking him up. And actually it helped. Isn't this thing judgment about gratitude? Yeah. People don't understand gratitude. And right there, you've got a child, I'm assuming, that can't communicate. 
yeah, yeah you know yeah. It's, again it's a feeling and you can yeah. feel the feeling again yeah. the look in the eye like you can f- you probably take yourself back there it's probably an amazing moment for you and you yeah. actually you can you can sense that yeah this is again a question I could pick off the cuff here that I've just thought about because I think this is where people's ignorance gets the worst of them because again they'll see people like Harley and again like out for days stuff and they don't really understand what I'm trying to word this because I'm going to off the cuff guys. What can they understand? What can't they understand? What do they experience? I know you you've never been in that situation, but from your experience with that, like are they just normal kids? That are struggling to process what's going on and verbalize it. Can you? Is, that, is my question making sense? It does make sense. It's different for every child, as because everyone's different. Yeah. So you know, we we can't really put a a consistent answer to that question. All I can tell you is about Harley. So number one, you've got the doctor telling you what you can and can't do, and he's just like, okay, which is you know, practice this area, right? textbook yeah. answer, yeah. Um, and then you've got kind of like these other people who are like these spiritual people who tell you, oh, it's okay, you can do this, you can do that, you'll be fine, and energy and all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, okay, great. But what am I seeing and what am I feeling in my interactions with Harley? Um, Harley, um, you know, Harley understood um, who we were. He understood, understood experiences. He he had a favourite films, even though he could hardly really see it. We, he reacted differently. He always reacted to could Aladdin. He hear, okay. Yeah, he could yeah, hear perfectly so the, well. The, the, the movie, you yeah. still got the sound, haven't you? And all that, stuff, all yeah, that yeah. sort of stuff. Whenever I used to come in from work and talk, he would start smiling and all that sort of stuff. So he had life experiences and a, and, and a quality of life is that, that we can't really comprehend what that is. But all we do know is that there are parts of life that he really enjoyed and there are things that he loved. And... That is life, isn't it? Yeah. yeah? You know what I mean? Happiness and love. What, what more is there to it, really? It's only the other bullshit that we add on to it. Yeah. You know, um, he was there. He was in the moment. The only problem uh, for him was he also went through significant periods of pain. Yeah. And suffering. So I think the, the level of comprehension was basic, but enough for him to understand that he was alive and he is a person and they're my parents, you know? Because this is the thing for me. It's like you, you look at some of this stuff and, again, as an outsider, not knowing anything being ignorant, you might be like, what kind of quality of life has the kid got? Mm. But right there, what you're saying is, he had a good quality, again, he got to enjoy what you said, that is what life is. We and had doctors arguing stuff, with us, though. He probably experienced stuff that, that adults will never experience in their life. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Conscious adults that can think and verbal, will never experience some of the pleasure that he actually experienced yeah. in his life. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. We had a doctor tell us once that we're being unfair um, by keeping him alive. I said, we're not keeping him alive, he's, he's, he's alive. Okay, no. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I, don't swear, I don't tend to swear on the podcast for, yeah. for getting to get school kids listening. Um, but my guess, I'm more than welcome to, but that is absolute fucking bullshit. Yeah. Again, talking about doctors and mm. whether that's their opinion or not, yeah. is that going to help yeah. you? No, is that gonna exactly. Help, is that going to help you? Yeah, even is if it going to help Lucy? Is it going to help yeah. Harley? What's because the objective? What, the does, that, what yeah. does that do? Yeah. That's got me so wound up. Yeah. I can't imagine what it's like because like, what does that bring? Yeah. No yeah. hope. So, so you're going to kill all hope. Yeah. I don't, I think that's, there, that's there, was, there was no real objective to, to saying something like that to no. a, a, two young parents who were struggling. Who were struggling yeah. Whether you were str- whether you were str- showing you were struggling or not, yeah. again, as an adult, yeah. quote unquote, intellectual doctor, you should be able to understand here yeah. that that is not a time and a place to say that, and how you go yeah. about saying that as well. Yeah. Um, fast forward him. How you used to mention about um, when Harley was having um, the, the, the seizures in his brain, and that's when things started to deteriorate. When he did finally pass, was it a sudden thing? Was it uh, a slow, gradual decline? Like what can you, again, not nice to talk about, but can you sort of ex- talk me through the yeah. last like couple of weeks uh, of his uh, life? He, 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 everything was as normal, and uh, he caught a cold. He developed into pneumonia. I was in Nottingham. Lucy was down in Southampton. We lived in um, a place called Easy, just outside of Southampton in, in Hampshire. Um, she phoned me and said, he's... he's, he's He's got a chest infection. I was like, okay. Um, we think it's turned to pneumonia. It's like, oh, that's not good for him. And she said, I don't think, I think this is it, Joe. And she'd never said that before, ever. So for her to say that to me on the phone, at this point, me and Lucy aren't in a relationship anymore. We we separated it when um, Holly was four. Um, and, and, you know, I, I knew at that moment, now, she was with a doctor, um, David Shapiro, amazing doctor, amazing bloke. And I'm three hours away. And um, he picked, he, he, he took the phone off. He went, Joe, and he went, look, he went, he's got pneumonia, it's bad. Um, 
I'm just going to be honest with you. Do not drive down here like a madman. You're not going to make it. He will not make three hours. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I just said, put Lucy back on. I'm at Lucy, I'm leaving now. Tell him I'm on my way down. So, in my mind, I'm like, right. She, she could, because Lucy said this, I know this is real. And I got in and I drove a banger Voxel Astra. Could only get down the road. Old school ones. (laughs) Old school Lastra, right? And I'm just like, you know, I was on my ass at the time. I'm just like, right, this fucking car's got to make it down there for a start. So I got in the car. I didn't drive fast. I didn't rush because I knew he would wait for me. And I got there on six o'clock, 6 p.m. And we was in a hospice because there's a a place called Naomi House Children's Hospice down there, which is an incredible place, which kind of... Really impacts our lives in a positive way, and they do uh, bereave, like bereavement care and aftercare and all that sort of stuff. And um, we don't want him to pass away in a hospital bed, so we took him there. And they said, "Look, you can come to us. Bring all the family. It's fine." So I drove down there. It took me about three hours to get there, um, standard time. And uh, he was, you know, he 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 was alive still, and um, he was actually smiling in the bed, which is which, you know, was not what I was expecting. And I've got all this family outside the room, loads of people there. And then we had 24 hours together um, and then he passed away. Wow, so from going through, he's not going to make it three hours. Mm. You talk about fighting till the end. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. that's pretty intense. Yeah. Um, when you said there, what the doctor said to you, I, I've never, ever, ever, like, felt myself going on a podcast like that. that mm. I can't imagine what that was like. And for you to actually get down there in a calm, controlled manner, it says a lot about you. I think you're an incredible person. I thought that when we was in the kitchen. I was like, this, you've got good energy about you. Thank you. But going back to when you were that age, to rationally, again, not be speeding, to be completely calm, he's going to make it. And then to actually get in there and no, have that knowingness. Mm. I mean, imagine if, you know, I think about, I think about this, I think, imagine if I was in a panicked state and I was, you know, putting my foot down and, and I was crying and I was I was really scared. How horrendous would those three hours have been? Yep. Uh, so I told myself, I've, I've got to remain in control here. I've got to get down there. You've got to get there. Yeah, and have got to get faith. There first. Yeah. I've got to have faith. Yeah. Are no you point religious? Me, uh, I'm not religious. I'm very spiritual. Yep. Um, I respect religion and people yep. who are religious. Same, yep. um, I have my own spiritual beliefs. Um, and I, 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 I just knew that he didn't need me to be in that state. And that's how I'd always thought with Harley. He needs me to be okay. And I did that for seven years, mm. be okay. You know, so what why, why would you ruin it? I'm not, why not, the last, well, I'm not going to do it now. Yeah, because yeah. you, when you're showing up, like you said, whether or not you can pretend in the car to get yourself composed, yeah. it's talk about energy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you've got to go in there yeah. and that's going to be the last time he sees you. What? Yeah. You're, after, well, after, to, se- after seven years, you're going to show up like that. Yeah, and I can't. Like, no. I have to walk in the room and put my arm around him and tell him it's, everything's okay. Was it a peaceful passing? I was just like a, yeah. yeah. Um, how did you then deal with that? Because like I said, that is every parent's worst nightmare. Although you knew it was coming at some point, you literally been given three hours to kind of mentally prepare for it. And then that 24 hours after that, how do you then actually process that? Because you've basically had this sustained amount of period where you've been fighting, holding it together. <sighs> was there a relief that he was now not in pain? Was there anything like that that came about? Like, what, what were you going for at that moment? Um, I, I don't, you know, people have asked me this before. It's really hard to articulate those sorts of emotions, but there was definitely relief that he wasn't in pain anymore, without a doubt. Um, and there was a lot of shock, um, even though we knew it was coming. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but being in a room and someone passed away is a really, um, a really, I can't, really get the words for it the energy is so strong in the room you felt like there was something else in the room you feel like there is something in the room with you mm. when that happens um he had like these blemishes and spots on his face from where he'd been sweating because he was ill and the moment he passed away everything disappeared he almost looked angel like it was really bizarre so all these weird feelings are going on and behind them weird feelings is an onslaught of um an onslaught of sadness it's real sadness um that just it's almost like it fought its way out um because <laughs> the mod was even when he passed away i still didn't want to let myself go because he was still there i was in this habit of being strong for him for seven years 
I never would cry in front of him to make him feel safe. And those reactions were still there. And it was just like, I was a bit confused. And then it just all came out. And, you know, it's, I was just, you know, like, you know, a, a waterfall of just crying and, and really being um, out of control for the first time in you imagine seven years worth of being in control that, 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 I, all I'm imagining right now is this chest that's been locked up between the movies where it's shaking yeah. and then eventually it kind of explodes that's yeah. what I'm imagining right it's now like open it's Pandora's 100%. box 100% I, I, like, I can't imagine because again some of the emotions you were describing earlier I've kind of I've felt yeah. like, like everyone has but then I'm thinking to myself, how would I have suppressed that and then carried on? Yeah. And this is the bizarre thing. This is where, for me, I feel extremely blessed to do... We went from before I'm doing podcasts. This is why I love doing what I'm doing because I always wonder to myself, how do people do this? Mm. Like, if I was listening to this podcast, I'd be like, how did this guy do it? But you're now explaining... like you, you you do, know, It's almost you, like superhuman. If you tell me a story about something you've been through, which is completely different, I would do the same. Yeah. I would sit and go, how has he done that? It's bad, isn't it? it when you're placed in a situation... Your, all your natural instincts will kick in. But, but as a child, which yeah. is all you fundamentally were, that's what I keep telling myself. It's not you. It's I, I look at myself when I was 22, 22, 23, 24, 25, 20, 20, 20, I'm we're like... St- we're still kids, aren't we? We're still kids. Especially, we, especially we are, blokes. When you get to 30, that's when you really sort of hit yeah, into you a level. you start to grow up. So for you to be in a place where you're, you were consciously aware of, I have to be strong here, mm. that is such... And again, not even that, strong for, for Lucy as well. So mm. you're almost fighting a war on two fronts. Yeah. And that in and of itself, at the best of times, is hard. Yeah. Not, a, not let alone like individual. That, that again, like what Lucy's going through, to be hospitalized, she's yeah. that bad. Yeah. And then you've got Harley going through what he's going through. Yeah. It's like almost like two extremes of that. Yeah. When did your mental health, I'm going to assume, I don't know, when did your mental health take a dive? Because I, I, I can't imagine that you have gone from that moment till now and your mental health stay in check. I may be wrong. But that's a lot to be dealing with there. How did you go about dealing with that? Have you dealt with it? Yeah. So, again, another long journey. So, uh, the first, me and Lucy, Lucy separated. So, I moved out of the house. Can I just wrote it down? How, how was that? Like, was there a reason? Was it just too much for you both? Was it? Like, you, we what? can't maintain a relationship when the constant focus is something else that's in the house. Yeah. We just we just grew apart yeah. we just stopped loving yeah. each other I just wanted to sort of uh, highlight I, I figured that's what happened it's a lot of yeah, pressure yeah, on, on any yeah, relationship yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. so I didn't mean to interrupt there but no no, no it's to, fine yeah, yeah. it's fine so um, when we separated you know I'd been with Harley every day I woke up every morning and he was there so you know for me to move out of the house uh, because it, our relationship became toxic and I didn't want him around that energy so we you know I moved out that's when it first bombed so I, I think that's the only time in my life I actually probably suffered from depression because it was a very bizarre feeling that suddenly came and you know having to deal with that um i i felt like that for a period of time um and then i kind of like come out the other side of that fairly quickly um but in regards to the kind of like my life now since he's passed away you know so it was his 10th anniversary um a couple of weeks ago so it's, it's 10 years um how have i dealt with it I've had lots of bereavement therapy. I've had treatment for PTSD, which which helped me, which tells me I have PTSD. I haven't got a formal diagnosis because it's just a label that I'm not really interested in. Um, and I think that those things have, have had a massive impact on my life, uh, particularly in relationships. My fiance, you know, bless her, when we first got together, she had to put with so much because I was behaving and things were coming out in ways that I didn't even realise, you know, the way um, uh, the way my grief come out because I wasn't allowing myself to be... Fu- I couldn't do what I'm doing now with you. You were still... Five you, years ago. Were you still maintaining that? Oh, maintaining that strong... I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, I'm going to do it my own way. But I would go to therapy and, and, and talk about it there. And that really, really did help me. Um... But I would say, if I'm going to be completely honest with you, Dan, I think the past two to three years is when I've really started to process it properly in a healthy way. And is that because you're in a healthy relationship that's allowed that? Or is it because you've done different kind of therapy? What, what would you, again, for my audience listening to this, because this is almost like two podcasts in one, because you've now got a, a man dealing with his mental health. Mm. Like, and you, you sort of saying, I, I want to kind of break that down a little bit, rather than sort of like passing it under, because to go for what you've gone through, which is so intense, to now in a place where you seem to be in a very good place. I just want to kind of break that down a bit because uh, I don't want it to seem like it was an overnight thing because I know, having some impression, it wouldn't have been. So how has that actually come about for you? How have you got yourself yeah. to the place that you're at now? I think that the therapy helps. Treatment for PTSD helps. Um, 
I choose not to take medication. That's a personal choice of mine. We're always trying to solve a problem with mental health. and It's a really big thing that we've all got to contribute to. But we all have such different experiences. And what will work for me may work for someone out there, but not may work for everybody. This is all around... For me, I've, I've spent the past few years, I say the past, you know, three, four years, whatever, trying to build a mindset. This mindset came about from a few days after Holly's funeral. A few days after his funeral, I woke up one morning... And I'll never forget, it. I was in my mate's apartment that he was letting me stay in. Um, everyone had gone home back up to Nottingham because the funeral was down south. I looked outside and the world's just going on. Like everyone's back to normal, but I'm still in this place. At that point, my life had completely deteriorated around me. I was in no relationship. I didn't have a child anymore. Um, I, I, I was at a job that I didn't really like. You know, I was broke. And I thought to myself, right, what am I going to do? And I sat down there and I, and I rationalised it to myself and I was like, okay, how am I going to sit in a chair like this for the rest of my life and feel depressed and, and allow these demons to take control of me? If I'm going to do that, what's the point? Uh, what, why? That's, that's hell. That's living in hell, as far as I'm concerned. So I thought, I don't want to do that. The second thing is I could just die, and hopefully I get to see Harley again, because for, you know, forget everything else. Mm. Let's just do that. Then the third one was, or I can try and live my life to the absolute full and live enough life for me and Holly, and make it worth it, because being alive comes with guilt. I live with guilt every single day, because I have to rationalise that. Why am I still here doing these things, and he's not? I should I should have died before him. That's the natural cycle of life. So there's lots of guilt going on. And I, and I made that promise to myself, like, right, if I'm going to stay around and I'm going to do this, I just need to kind of go away and build a life the best I possibly can and try my best not to allow these demons that are lurking around get inside me and, 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 and take over my life. Much easier said than done. Oh, so much easier said than done. What are you talking about? Like, yeah, yeah. I'm sat in, I'm like, mate, I'm putting myself in the, yeah. your, your shoes. I'm like, Much easier said yeah, than oh, done. Yeah, yeah. One thing that I've realised, you know, over the past few years is that the, one of the first things that I do is I do not victimise myself. Okay, so so... We see this so much in life about people being victims. I don't look up at the sky and say why. I never have, and I refuse to do it. I don't blame the doctors. I don't tell myself that life isn't fair. Because the moment we start telling ourselves these things, we victimise ourselves, and people do this blindly without even realising. Now, if you are a victim, you are suffering. And it's as simple as that. Any victim. Sometimes that's justified. If you jump over the table and pound my head in, I'm in hospital, I will blame you. And I'm a victim, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and that's justified. There's no justification for my scenario. I refuse to, to live as a victim. And, and w just that one thing alone allows me to take responsibility for my own life. Yep. Because if you don't take responsibility for everything that, that, that you do in your life, you, your life's going to be pretty tough. Life's going to be pretty hard if you go around blaming everything and everyone in life and God and the person next door and all that sort of stuff. So for me, um, I need to acknowledge, even though this, some people might think this is a bit extreme, but I chose to have a child. Mm. These things happen. It's very rare, and no one thinks it's going to happen to them. But I still made that choice. Yes, I was a kid, a daft kid. Mm. But I still made that choice. And in life, we lose people that we love. Sometimes we lose people that love at the expected time, like our grandparents when they're in their 80s. Sometimes we lose relationships because our partner cheats on us or, or has enough of us. Sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes people lose children. You, you have to build an acceptance of this is where you are. Mm. And, and there's no such thing as fear. And, you know, there's no one up there going, you know, this is going to happen to you and not you. And there's no prejudice God up in the clouds, you know, making these decisions for you. When you're in here, when you're in this game of life, these are the rules, and this could happen to you. So when you build acceptance, not just about me losing Harley, but acceptance of everything that happens in life, and I refuse to victimise myself, already I'm on a really stable foundation to keep on top of my mental health. Because every battle I've got is just mine. And um, it, it involves nobody else, and it's mine, and it's mine alone. And, and the alone part is really, really important. This is my responsibility and mine alone to deal with. And all of a sudden, I've narrowed down a battle that feels like it's ginormous, and it's this big. 
that if I just focus on this and keep on top of this and managing this, I can wake up in the morning and take another step forward. And, and that's how I live my life. And I've almost reinforced that as a habit to make sure that I continue to do it. And listen, I, I wake up some mornings and I, I'm not feeling good, mm-hmm. you know, and um, I struggle. I struggle around dates birthdays anniversaries numbers are really significant for some reason for us and you know it's hard but you know when when you fall down and have those bad moments you've still got this foundation that you've built for yourself around the way you're viewing the world and your reality that you're living in that's probably one of the most powerful five minutes of the podcast I've ever had. I don't think you really understood what you've said there. When you go back and listen I, back to it, <laughs> when you go, I, I, I know full well you didn't because you do. You were in the state where I go into, and you're in a flow state, and you were just talking. When you listen back to that, what you've just said there is incredibly powerful for for so many people listening right there. I, I, I hope someone can. T- t- uh, t- and this is why no, I'm here no talking. Hope. There's no hope. That that right there is profound. What you've just said there about just getting bit, like victimizing ourselves yeah. which for me, and it completely disempowers you completely. and like I said you had every right to sit there in that victim mindset saying this isn't yeah. fair this isn't that but yeah. as you sort of mentioned you've gone through all of that pain make it worth something and now, you're exactly. li- and now what you're doing is like I said you're living the life for two yeah brilliant and everything you're doing yeah. again is in memory of course and it's all positive it's empowering rather than like again as you said why am I still here well you're still here to do amazing things which is exactly what you're doing with the trust mm. and there's that amazing thing there's 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 that thing that life happens for us not to us and it's like it's it's happened for you to help impact so many more lives yeah and like I said it, it's one of the things where do you wish I was still here well, absolutely 100% yeah. but there's nothing you can do about that all you can do now is this is the situation this is the reality how can I make this worth something yeah. and then the work you've done on yourself now and as I mentioned before like the kind of person that you are like how you're articulating yourself like the work you've done on yourself the fact of you're going to therapy the fact of you're taking responsibility for what you can control and all this sort of stuff that's incredible because you're going to be impacting more people than you know you mentioned now you've got a fiance yeah. cool so by you showing up how you've shown up yeah. and understanding some of these demons that you've got you're going to show up as a better partner yeah, of course. What then impacts her life, and again, it just kind of yeah. the whole thing. And a better father because I've got a, a son now, you know, who's four years older, but two stepdaughters, and you know, I have a responsibility as well. Let's not forget that I have a responsibility, you know, to make sure that I'm looking after myself. But the remarkable thing about all this is that if someone's listening to this podcast and says, "Wow, I can't believe he's speaking like this," the reason why is because most people expect me to be in a hole of depression. You just said it yourself; like it's completely justified for me to be a bum, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And no one, everyone would accept it. Oh, well, why has this happened? Oh, I lost my son. Oh, done. Yeah. Just okay. sit at home okay. every day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sit at home and, and, and claim benefits and, you know, drink beer and whatever Especially it is. you had and... nothing at that moment in time as well. Like, oh, so oh, you, like, you just mentioned, you were basically a robot. Like, like, like I said, it's not robot. like you were in a, in a really strong relationship, you were earning good money. You literally mentioned you were in a job you hated, you had no partner, you literally had nothing. You were literally at rock bottom and then you've lost your son. And like Rock you said, what, what, how many more points do you need for it to be like, yeah, actually just, just sit and do nothing now for the rest of yeah. your life. Like you had every yeah. reason and excuse to do that, but you didn't yeah. take that. Yeah. And I think there is also the other side of it. I think, you know, when you experience rock bottom, and I mean, when you go to the depths of hell in your mind, sometimes that's a motivator to come back up again. Mm. And, and, you know, sometimes I, I think about maybe that played a part, maybe a part of, of, of getting me to go, no, I'm not staying here. Mm. No way. Um, I wasn't kind of like um, some people are perverse into uh, staying there for some reason, and 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 you know I I just I didn't want that for me. I, th- I think they stay there, and again, this is an interesting thing. It's not comfortable because again, when you're there, you're you can constantly replay yourself the pain. Yeah. But again, the pain kind of in a way where people think it keeps them closer. Yeah. To 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 to, to Harley, it's like no, that no, that's not that's not what this is about. But yeah. they can kind of if I stay here. Then I'm gonna, I'm never gonna forget him. It's like, well, you're never gonna forget. You said mentioned here, like you've got you've got all these things, and you living your life right now is a constant memory of him, for the positive. Yeah, and I think you know that's a really insightful thing that you've just said. Pain and grief keeps people closer. So one thing I do do um, at the moment is um, I go to a charity called Zephyrs. Zephyrs is a, lo- a local Nottingham-based charity, and it's for bereaved parents. Incredible, incredible place, uh, and they do um, uh, group sessions. So I go there once a month and as a parent and there are parents all around this table and some of them have lost children recently, some of them are like me 10 years, some are like 20 years and the ones that are, uh, have gone through it more recently, they say exactly what you just said. They're grieving, they're upset, but they're glad that they're grieving upset because that grief and upset keeps them closer to their child. Um, and I think it's a sad, it's such a sad thing to watch um, 
but everyone's on their own journey. You have to respect them for what they're doing. And this is what I said at the very, very start of this podcast, coming full circle, is that what you've done today is give people like that light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Because when it's dark, though, you need a bit of hope and a bit of belief. Mm. And I said, when you're in that, that moment there, it's hard, it's dark, you can see there's no way out mm. because you've lost your world. Mm. But actually, there is a way out. And again, you can sort of, to the best of your ability, turn that negative into a positive. Mm. Can we talk about uh, this amazing trust that you've got? So... What is the Harley J Trust? Can you give me as much information about it as you possibly can? Because uh, again, when I was watching the video on it online, it, it seemed like an amazing thing that you're doing. Like, what made you set that up? Like, where did that come about in the journey? So, um, during Harley's life, um, he had lots of difficulties. And where, and where we lived, um, it was great for healthcare, but social care wasn't so great. And he needed a very specialist wheelchair, okay? And at that time, you know, we're only young, didn't really have the, the money, so you get the one that the government gives you. And it's horrendous. Like, I would never put him in that in this chair. But I, and it, it was like two and a half grand at the time um, to buy the one that we wanted. No funding anyway. So his nan set up a trust fund, call it, and called it the Harley J Trust. She did a fundraising event and um, raised loads more money than what we needed. So, you know, she, and then people started donating. And we had, in the end, we had to give some of the money to other families because, like, well, we don't need it. So it goes somewhere else and then after kind of Harley passed away I wanted to do something for him in um in his memory I wanted to continually acknowledge the struggles that we went through and the gaps in the service and the support that we received so I took the trust I turned it into a registered charity got a group of friends together and said look let's can we do something um I I spoke to the management team after lots of meetings with the pediatric critical care unit at the Queen's Medical Hospital um, and the paediatric critical care unit is the high dependency and intensive care brought together and um, children with conditions are called life limiting or life changing conditions that are similar to Harley's. Um, they often have to spend a lot of time on them wards. You know, some, some of these kids are in there for a year, 18 months. We'd Harley spent half of his seven years mm. in hospital. And whilst the healthcare is, is, was good, it's now deteriorating as you all know. The NHS yeah. is really struggling. The wards really struggling and they can, they can give them their basic health needs, but there are so many things that those families and children need that, that no one is able to give them. A really simple one is, we have a kid in the hospital who's been there for six months and he needs to go home, he's ready to go home, but they can't go home because they haven't got a wheelchair that can carry the child and their ventilator that's keeping them alive. And we, the Harley never had to have a ventilator, he was rare though. Most of them with these conditions have to have a ventilator. So it's a tracheostomy that goes to the ventilator. No one will fund it, so they can't go home. They're in hospital for another two, three months. Even though they, even though they don't have to be. They've got to be. So, yeah. so a lot of these kids have got potentially like uh, shortened life anyway. Yeah. And they're spending an extra two months on yeah. the ward. That yeah, take up to. a bed as well, and no one will fund it. Uh, so, we, so we buy them, it's £1,000. They get to go home their lives are limited and they need to spend as much time at home as they possibly can. So we, we'll buy it from them and, and they go home. And we do all sorts of things. We we do things like going home wishes. So when they when they get discharged from hospital, we give them money to go and do something nice, go away for the weekend or do a nice experience with the child. We buy the hospital ward equipment, iPads for the kids when they're in there. We go up every Christmas with presents and Santa, every Easter with Easter eggs. We've got, we, we, get, we decorate it at, at Halloween and every anything we possibly can. We do um, parent networking groups where they go and um, the parents because we didn't get enough of that where we could be that, with other parents thing. Like to, go, thing. to go through it because you feel like you're alone alone but yeah. actually to have someone well first of all someone like yourself that's been in that situation yeah. and again hasn't got stuck in that hole to come yeah. to the side yeah. give them hope like we mentioned before then actually to be like Right, here's other parents that are going through yeah. it. So you've almost created like a community of people that they can almost lean on each other a little bit so, yeah. so they're not alone. Yeah, yeah. So it, 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 we've been going now since 2015 um, and, you know, it's a small charity. We do this on a voluntary basis though. It's not my job. Yeah, you know, I do this on the side in, 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 my, in my spare spare time. <laughs> I don't know if that exists. Yeah, I was going to say, what is that? Um, in my spare time, there's five of us that run it um, and, you know, we raise like 50, 60 grand a year probably and we just give it all out to people, to, to, to those that need it. Um, but well, I think one day I would really love to be able to do it full time, but I also want a business on the side. I've got my own business um, and just out of pure coincidence, I worked in, with children and children's social care. It's got nothing, no link whatsoever. So, you know, I run a company where and we, we, we operate residential care homes for children in care as well. And that's massively demanding. It's such a, a massive demand on me uh, to run that service. Uh, but that's 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 what I do for a living. So 
the Holly J Trust is something that's kind of like on the side. We're all really enthusiastic about it, but I think you know one day I'm going to really be able to just you know adopt myself to that charity mm. and hopefully do more and 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 raise as much as we can. Joe, you are an absolutely incredible human. Thank uh, you. I, I, gen- I generally mean that. Just say that I don't take compliments very well. I know. Well, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna shower you with them because um, I said. <laughs> The fact of uh, you come on here and you've articulated that so well, because then I said, no matter how many times you're going to share it, it's, it's ten, it, it took me ten years to be able to do yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like I said, it, and I know it's not an overnight thing. Even when you're talking, I can see. Yeah. It just I, I can see. And the fact of what you're doing to 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 let that legacy live on, the fact you've been so open and honest with the whole intention of actually helping other people has been absolutely incredible. Not only that, the fact you're doing this charity work on the side mm. of then your actual job, which is also helping people as well. Mm. Uh, and not only that, the fact of you've actually been man enough to take care of your mental health and work on yourself, which is a hard thing. Like that is the most manly thing that you've done. I've, yes, you've had to stay there and be firm, but actually the hardest thing is actually knowing that you've got to become a better person to help yeah. other people. Phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, you're an incredible human. Uh, and I just want to say thank you very much for actually talking and sharing about this. It's been genuinely an absolute pleasure talking to you. And uh, I mean that. Look, thanks for having me on. And I think, you know, one thing that I've acknowledged is that doing these things is healthy again. So let's, you know, for everyone listening, you know, this isn't just about me coming on to tell other people. This is my process as well. You, you, by bringing me on here, you've helped me. Um, the more I speak about this, the more I give this to the world, the better my mental health is going to be. And this is what we're trying to encourage. The more mental health will be and the more help people you will help as well. So yeah. it's that ripple effect. Honestly, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome.